This is Chicago. At the dawn of the 21st century, Chicago's media was dominated by a handful of major corporations. But a resistance movement arose to free Chicago's media from their clutches. One player in this movement is the Chicago Independent Media Center and its TV show, Chicago Independent Television. The Independent Media Center is a worldwide network of grassroots correspondents committed to using the tools of the media for promoting social and economic justice. You are watching this month's dispatch from the Chicago Independent Media Center. Welcome to Chicago Independent Television, a collection of progressive video reports about local community issues by grassroots media workers, produced free from corporate or commercial support or influence. I'm your host, Jeanette Foreman. On today's show, we'll hear three important stories. First, we'll hear the story of the Whittier School sit-in in which a group of students and parents who wanted a library for their school occupied a building slated for demolition and won. Next, we'll hear an update on the RNC-8, a group of activists jailed before the 2008 Republican National Convention for conspiracy. We'll also report on how local third-party candidates were unfairly excluded from debates and media coverage limiting the public's ability to make voting choices. Stay with us. Chicago Independent Television is not brought to you by AT&T, the company lobbying hard to destroy network neutrality and public access television. Learn more at savetheinternet.com. AT&T, your world degraded. Welcome back to Chicago Independent Television. Chicago Public Schools recently slated a community building for a controversial demolition. Local neighborhood parents and students who wanted a library for their school occupied the building. They finally won their demands, as we'll see in this segment. The Whittier Dual Language Elementary School is a school located in Pilsen, which of course is um, one of the poor neighborhoods in Chicago. And about seven years ago, the single moms, or well, moms, parents in general, uh, of kids at Whittier, got together and started realizing that, um, that this field house that had been on school grounds since the school started and had been used widely for at least 50 years, uh, they wanted to continue to hold programming there. And there were some rumors starting to circulate that perhaps the field house um, wasn't going to be updated when the school was updated. And there were uh, facilities that were just a wreck inside the school. So they started agitating about seven years ago to get some funding to actually renovate the school. Um, it took a, an incredibly long time and was um, a sort of ridiculously concentrated effort uh, to convince the city to bring TIF funds in to actually renovate the school. Finally, they agreed to $1.7 million in TIF money that actually went to school renovations. And then when the renovations were completed, the parents went in and were sort of appalled by the, the level of renovation. So the renovations were shoddy. The parents were incredibly upset. And they went to the, the school board and said, hey, we need to know how you accounted for this enormous amount of money that's public money in the first place, the TIF program in the United States, in, the, in Chicago, of course, is, is public funds. Um, and we demand to know how this happened, that you spent all this money and basically did the worst possible job. So um, over the summer, uh, the parents realized that the plan was to demolish the field house and actually build a soccer field, which would then be on private lease to a neighborhood private school. 
Um, so that TIF money had been, once again, used to privatize public land. And then around the same time, a number of the parents, um, at least a number of the parents that I spoke to, Lisa Anganese is, is one of the most articulate on this issue. She noted on their sort of like preschool materials that all of the students that were going to attend this elementary school needed a library card. And so after they, her kids were in school for a couple of weeks, she asked them, you know, what's up with a library card? Like, where's your, where's your school library? And, and her kids were like, well, we don't have a library. They, at that point, only had a couple of books that they could check out from their actual classroom. And, but no public place to study, no um, resources or facilities, and no actual um, place to house books within the school. So when they realized that the field house was going to be demolished and when they started realizing that there were facilities that were absolutely necessary to make the school the kind of school that would support their children's education, they sort of combined these issues and decided to try to demand a, a library be built in the field house um, and that that space continue to be used for the public programming and community programming that had been going on there for a while. The, the parents, this group of parents, most of them being mothers, a surprising number of them being actually undocumented, um, and most of them single and, and working and raising their kids by themselves, uh, went to inter interrupt Ron, CEO Ron Huberman um, at some sort of public meeting that he was at and started you know, demanding this library and that the field house be saved. And he refused, he just blew them off as he really, really had been for the last seven years. And the moms were so pissed and just done that they moved into the field house and they just stayed there. And they stayed there for 44 days. Um, they had food brought in and air mattresses and they took care of their kids and they had this amazing community support system that they built up. They were sort of fine there for 44 days, which was a pretty significant sit-in. Along the way, a number of things did happen. Um, police, of course, tried to come and oust everyone. Um, however, what the police did succeed in doing was actually uh, intimidate all of the undocumented women and, and family members into leaving the sit-in. A number of the parents without papers did end up leaving and were intimidated into silencing their protest, but that was only about half of the people who had made a commitment to actually stay there. And really from there, a new group of moms started coming in, and so the numbers swelled again. So finally, what happened was the Chicago Public Schools went in and had, the, had people's uh, natural gas shut off the gas right on the coldest day of the year. Um, the aldermen at that point stepped in and actually took it to the city and they uh, had an injunction that basically demanded that Chicago Public Schools turn the gas back on. And pretty quickly then, this uh, debate turned into a negotiation. So all of a sudden the Chicago Public Schools was willing to come on board now that the aldermen had actually expressed some level of support for what the women at Whittier were doing. So then there were meetings planned. Huberman had sort of notoriously skipped most of them. Um, there was a, um, another inspection done on the building. The building was found not to be quite as dangerous as everyone had been saying, except for the moms for the entire time. And so state uh, discussions started to be held around, well, could we actually turn this into a library? Can we turn it into a community center? How is this going to work? Um, and finally, after the 44th day of protest, the everyone reached sort of a verbal agreement that there would be a library built somewhere on school grounds. The, the field house would be renovated and it would be turned over to the parents committee, an official organization that the parents had begun. And um, the school would lease them the building for a dollar a year. So all of this is very positive and very um, 
excellent news. The problem is that in agreeing to it, everyone sort of overlooked the fact that actually there already isn't enough room in the school. The school is overcrowded. So how this is all going to work is still being discussed, but that there was an agreement made is great progress. I think one of the ongoing issues is that while this addresses the immediate need of the parents to actually build a library for their particular kids, there's 161 Chicago public schools that don't have any library whatsoever. And so there's um, all sorts of questions still up in the air about how, you know, whether or not libraries and even books at this point are necessary for education. So that's one of the issues that came up during all of this. The other, of course, is the larger issue of, of, public, uh, of accountability of public funds. And the fact that this was a seven-year struggle over TIF money, which is supposed to be doing what here it eventually did, which is improve a neighborhood in need, in desperate need of development, um, that it took seven years and a 44-day occupation of young, <laughs> of, of working mothers in Pilsen um, is, I think, speaks a lot more profoundly to what the problems are in Chicago right now than, than, than the library issue, which is sort of sexy and cute and like it put nerds on the front page of the newspaper and that's great, but, but um, you know, these are basic flaws in the system that need to be addressed immediately. You're watching Chicago Independent Television. Chicago Independent Television is not brought to you by Coca-Cola, whose logo is stained red by the blood of murdered Colombian labor union organizers. Learn more at killercoke.org. Coke, the drink of the death squad.